Welcome to the Mixology Talk Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Julia. And we're the folks behind abarabove.com, the ultimate resource for craft bartenders, bar operators, and just about anybody else looking to make great craft drinks. I'm a bar consultant with more than 10 years of industry experience. And I run abarabove.com, bringing weekly articles and cocktail recipes to help you make great drinks and grow your career behind the bar. This is episode number 94, and this week we're catching up on our long list of listener questions. By the way, if you have questions about bartending, mixology, or cocktails, feel free to send them in. Just head over to mixologytalk.com slash 94 and scroll down to the button where it gives you the option to submit your question. By the way, this podcast episode is sponsored by Q Drinks, a craft mixer company based out of New York. We're seeing a lot of great new craft mixers coming on the market recently, and I gotta say I've been really impressed with the quality, carbonation level, and flavor profile of Q Drinks tonic, grapefruit, and ginger beer mixers, along with the rest of their portfolio. They're made with real, carefully chosen ingredients and designed to let you create a complete, balanced cocktail with just their mixers and your spirit of choice. So thanks again to Q Drinks for supporting this podcast. So let's dig into the questions. The first question this week comes from Ray from Kansas City, Missouri. And he says, I've been reading through your list of 25 free classic bartending books, and I'm currently checking out The Ideal Bartender. What is a pony glass? Also, Bullock suggests that all liquors should be served straight by placing an inverted whiskey glass on the bar, setting a pony glass on it, and filling it with the liquor. What is the reasoning behind that? So it sounds like this is a two-part question. And the Can first... I answer the first part? Please, go for it. <laughs> So I did some research and a pony glass is a stemmed one ounce glass. It's something that you don't see a lot of anymore. But if you're ever wandering through the thrift store, you might actually see them. I think I've definitely noticed them in the the thrift store glassware section. Not that I spend a lot of time there, which I might. No comment. (laughs) (laughs) We both do it. That's a great place. It's a mutual problem. Beautiful, beautiful glassware. For 25 cents. It's super cheap and you don't have to get a billion of them. You only have to get one. Yeah, exactly. And when you break it, you're not heartbroken. Yeah. So anyway, a pony glass is a stemmed one ounce glass. It's also called a liqueur glass or cordial glass. You'll also see that as well. So I'm going to let you uh, tackle the second part of this question. And the real answer is, I don't know. I imagine it's probably for presentation. Um, It sounds like a really interesting way of presenting a liqueur for a person or a liquor, but I really have no idea. And if anybody knows, please Definitely leave it in the comments and we'll uh, we'll share that with everyone. Yeah. So the author says, I guess, well, Ray says that Bullock suggests that all liquors should be served straight by placing an inverted whiskey glass on the bar, setting a pony glass on it and filling it with a liquor. So it sounds like it'll make it look like a nice little pedestal almost. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think they were doing exact measurements, so I don't think that was the purpose of it yeah. by any means. But it but probably looked nice. Especially, you know, like, pretty fancy. I mean, if you don't have a lot of other presentation, that seems like it would really be a little bit more on a fancy um, side for the presentation. And you know that we like the fancy. We do like the fancy. <laughs> it's true. So so we don't know the real answer to the second part of the question on why Bullock suggests the specific presentation and specific way of serving. But if anybody else out there does, please let us know in the comments, mixologytalk.com slash 94. And the next question comes from Magan Than, and I'm probably butchering that because I have a terrible... Don't start doing accents. <laughs> time with accents <laughs> and names, evidently. But he's from Chennai, South India. And he writes, Hi there. I would like to make a cocktail for an international competition. Which liquor can I use? So I'm actually going to let uh, Julia answer this one because she took one of the seminars for Tales of the Cocktail and wrote an ebook or a, a yeah. blog post about this, right? Yeah, I, I've actually done quite a bit of research on how you win cocktail competitions. And I wrote a quick little guide on how to win cocktail competitions. I'll include the link to that in the show notes. If you're interested, uh, there will be a link. But to answer your question, I'm going to answer with the simplest answer first, which is read the rules. Almost every cocktail competition that I've come across is sponsored by a brand, a liquor brand, and they will tell you what you're allowed to use. Sometimes 
sometimes they'll even be as specific as telling you how much of what you can use. Start there. That's the most important thing. Because if you don't read the rules and you don't follow them, you just don't have a chance. So that's going to be the important thing. Yeah, it's going to be small print and it's going to be a lot of it probably, but it's worth it. If you're putting all the effort into putting together your own unique cocktail, it would be such a bummer to realize that you disqualified yourself by accidentally using a quarter ounce too much of the spirit. Yeah, I've done that in the past. And you have? Oh, yeah. No, I think one of the <laughs> first competitions I entered, I read the rules and I'm like, okay, slightly bent them. I think I put two extra that ingredients. Go? I got an honorable mention, but I was completely As disqualified. The dude who made the good cocktail, the breakfast. I think rules. that's actually what they said. <laughs> like, hey, this cocktail is really great. Didn't qualify. Didn't read the rules. Nice. Uh, so that's the first thing is definitely look at the rules. They will probably tell you what kind of liquor to use. Now, of course, they may specify the main liquor and not specify the rest of the things you use in, in the cocktail. They might be very, very specific about what you can and can't use. They may not be very specific at all. So if you have any sort of flexibility, then the next recommendation I would make is to actually look into the brands that are owned by the company, the, the same company that's sponsoring the liquor competition. So for example, what's a good example? Bacardi. Like Bacardi um, Diageo. Right. They own a lot of different spirits. And if you use spirits that are sort of partners in the portfolio, that's going to look really good. So if you want to find a rum, or find a rum that's from the same company. If you want to find a triple sec, find a triple sec owned by the same company. That tends to go over pretty well. And of course, the last caveat to that is if you need something really specific and special, as long as the rules don't specifically tell you you can't, then go for it. I mean, sometimes your cocktail is going to need something really unique. It's going to need that very specific herbal profile or very specific flavor or sweetness or whatever. And if the rules don't tell you you can't do it, then I say go for it. Yeah. And uh, I think at the end of the day, a lot of these cocktail competitions, as Julie mentioned, are sponsored by a liquor brand. And their motives are really about selling product. So the more that you can align with that and the more you can, you know, kind of put the spotlight on them and their products, the better chance you have, I would imagine. Yeah, it tends it tends to fare well. It tends to be a good move on the part of competitors who do that. A really, really good way to get yourself not disqualified, but probably ranked pretty low on the results is to accidentally use a competitor's product. For example, if you were in an absolute vodka competition and you were to use Sky Vodka, well, in that case, you'd probably be disqualified, but you're not going to do well. So just pay attention to the brands. The brands matter. Absolutely. The next question comes from Gonzo from Portugal, and he says... Hi, guys. I've recently found your podcast, and it's taken me a while to catch up to where you are now. But I'm sure by the time you've answered this, I will have. And full disclosure, uh, this is a few months old. So, Gonzo, I apologize for how long it took us to get to your question. <laughs> he continues, I've recently created a cocktail recipe using gin, lemon juice, and a Portuguese liqueur just shaken over ice and topped with soda water. It's pretty good, but I'm having a weird issue. The initial flavor is not very strong, but after about five or 10 minutes, the ice starts to melt and the flavor becomes really intense and really awesome, just as I'd originally intended. I don't know why this is happening, and I'm wondering how I can create that without waiting for the ice to melt. Any ideas? And this is why I love listener questions. These are my favorite episodes um, because we get kind of a Pretty wide spectrum of questions, and this one is pretty specific. You just like to nerd out. I really do, and I'm going to totally nerd out on this, so giant Any nerd alert. <laughs> so this anybody who doesn't want to go into that level of detail, you can skip to the next episode. Right, and this is, I, I don't know, I find this fascinating. First of all, Gonzo, great question, and thank you for this question. And the real answer is, I don't know which Portuguese liqueur you're using, but I imagine there's an aromatic compound to it kind of like bitters or like a Amaro, I imagine it's pretty dense in flavor. That being said, this is a really cool experiment that I would run. And I'll kind of lay out how I would go about this process with you. So I would probably set the Portuguese liqueur in a glass with water and see how long it takes for it to open up. Aromatic compounds open up in the presence of water. And this could be a lot of fun to figure out the timing of it. So if the ice is melting, maybe you can figure out how much water that actually is. And if you wanted to replicate it, it could be something that you just add water, that appropriate amount of water to it and let it sit for a shift. 
The other way you can go about experimenting, if you don't know for certain it's water, which I assume you do, is have a little bit of that liqueur in a glass with gin, have another glass full of lemon juice, and add the Portuguese liqueur to it and see if it actually opens up over time in each individual glass. Because we're assuming that it's water, but we don't know for sure. So, And of course, the last one is have the water and a Portuguese liqueur. And as always in, in any experiment, you have to have a control group because it could just be the Portuguese liqueur oxidizing in oxygen. So I guess that was redundant, but I would have <laughs> the Portuguese liqueur just sitting in the glass by itself. And I would try each one at a different time and start to make notes on, all right, how's it changing? What's the flavor profiles? And see what the responsible agent is, I guess, for having this product open up essentially. And then I would see about possibly batching and holding it for a certain amount of time. Is there any risk of losing the aromatics if you batch? Absolutely. Yeah. And just like lemon juice and lime juice, there's that four hour window. Then I would probably try to find out, okay, how long can I possibly hold this if I need to do it for a shift? Then you can figure out your par levels and say, you know, you're going to sell somewhere from six to 10 in a shift then you could pour out that much and let it start to mature and open up. So that's kind of the process that I would go about it. But I'm a nerd and I try to go through all the variables. And like I said, nerd alert, that's <laughs> that's what I would do. Let's be honest. Experimentation with this kind of stuff usually means drinking tasty things. So it's not so bad. It's true. No, it's definitely true. And, you know, this could be a lot of fun in controlling this particular liqueur. And you can really have fun with it experimenting with this, I could see putting this on a cocktail menu and explaining this process to a guest and saying, okay, here's the deal. When you first try this cocktail, it's going to be really mellow. It's going to be basically kind of a sour is kind of the framework that you're using. But here's the deal. It's going to open up a lot. It's going to change. And then if you know how long it takes for it to open up, you could really have a lot of fun with it. Say, okay, cool. Set your watch and say, all right, now try it. And you could just blow minds left and right. If it's that big of a difference, you could really have a ton of fun with this. You would totally do that. Oh, I totally would. I would totally mess with people with this cocktail. <laughs> um, and, I love it. And I mean, that's part of the fun of it, that you could really start to manipulate some of the variables that are in this cocktail and take people on a little bit of a journey and have a, have a good story behind it too. And so, by the way, Gonzo, do me a favor, let us know what liqueur that is, because I'm super interested in that. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, I would love to experiment with this liqueur. Yeah, let us know in the comments, mixologytalk.com slash 94. Perfect. And last question for today comes from James from New Jersey. And he asks, so I found and tried the homemade melon liqueur recipe, and it was delicious. Thank you, James. I appreciate that. I'll include a link to that in the show notes. We went through it pretty quickly, but I have to ask, how long do such things typically last on the shelf? Or is there a different method we could use to extend it so we can have homemade melon liqueur in winter months? And uh, I'll go ahead and fill this one if that's okay. This one's all you. So that is a great recipe. And I love that one because it gets melons right in the height of season. You get such a great flavor from it. And it's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy Even to make. I could make it. Stocking stuffers. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Everybody will love you. But for this one, I would probably take the approach that I would with limoncello. And that is make a giant batch of it, you know, whatever you need to get through the cold, dark, dreary winter months, <laughs> uh, whatever cocktails you're going to make in between, and put it in the freezer. This actually drinks really, really well straight out of the freezer because you don't have to worry about chilling it down. You're not going to dilute it. So it's going to come out like melon liqueur syrup. It's so good. It's super tasty. And it won't freeze because you've got that spirit component. Hopefully. Uh, I know that once spirits drop down below a certain percentage, the, the right. water can freeze. So if I it would... freezes, pull it out, defrost it, throw some more vodka in it. Right, exactly. <laughs> Highly and technical. Leave a little bit of room for it to expand if it does freeze. Yes. Um, so the glass doesn't break and you lose all of your lemon liqueur. Melon. Melon. Lemon, melon. <laughs> Dyslexia. Melon? Lemon, <laughs> melon. Same words, same letters. But yeah, so leave a little bit of room for just in case if the liquid does expand. So just to answer his other question, how long do they last on the shelf? It's kind of hard know. to say. I, I mean, it really depends on exactly how you made it. A lot of this stuff is preservatives. I mean, alcohol is a big preservative. 
Sugar, believe it or not, is a huge preservative. Uh, that's why you can have candy bars for years. So Speak they're for all yourself. antibacterials and it shouldn't really turn. You have the aromatic compounds, which is the one thing I would be really concerned about them falling off and kind of degrading. But as far as safety goes, if, if you've you, got enough spirit in there, it, sh- it should keep indefinitely. However, it sounds like it's just really tasty out of the freezer. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I would just go about it that way and not worry about just keeping it at room temperature. Just put it in a freezer and make a big old batch of it. Yeah. And of course, same rules apply if you open it up and it smells really funky. If you're seeing weird colors, obviously just let it go. The same rules that you would use with any other liqueur. Absolutely. So I got to say, I love the listener questions episode. I know I say this every time, but it's something I always look forward to because we get such a broad spectrum of questions. So definitely please keep them coming. We love them. And uh, it gives me the opportunity to just nerd out on certain topics. So you're doing me a favor and possibly our audience a disservice. So I apologize, but thank you. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, definitely keep them coming. Absolutely. And we may take a little bit of time to get to your question. I will admit we have a bit of a backlog right now, but we will get to them and we really do appreciate your questions. So you can find the button to leave questions on any show notes page. This week's show notes are mixologytalk.com slash 94. If you just scroll down, there's a big old button that says send us your questions. Yeah. And thank you for everybody that sent in questions up to this point. We love them. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Catch you in a couple weeks. Yeah. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.